Hello, my name is Judy Mikeson. I'm the news editor for MRS Bulletin. I'm here today with science photographer Felice Frankel, research scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We're going to talk about Felice's perspective article published in the new impact section of MRS Bulletin. Felice, welcome. Hi, Judy. It's, it's really a pleasure being with you. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> yes, and so I, I've been a fan of your work for a very long time. Uh, that's nice. <laughs> so it's really, yes, it's really, really nice to be able to talk with you um, about science photography, communicating science through images. Uh, so I want to ask my first question to you. In a perspective article, you write, one can argue that society has become dependent on the visual. Right. What do you mean? Yeah, what do you mean by this? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, I would say, very frankly, I don't have any data on this. If I were a true scientist in this field, I would have done my homework before I wrote that. But uh, just empirically and anecdotally, I'd like to say that when I work through, uh, with students and, and uh, PIs and, and the whole kit and caboodle that I have the privilege of working with, I am seeing a change in their interest in trying to visually come up with an expression of the work. Certainly with data visualization, which I don't do a lot of, but I do have some opinions about how some of this stuff works. But I'm definitely seeing, uh, I, there's no more uh, um, imposition anymore on my part. They're, they are welcoming me to talk to them about how to visually represent their evidence or their processes. But I also think that our society is very visually, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure they're dependent on it, but look at, look at what we're seeing all over the place with images and you know, Instagram and, and all the social uh, media is really very much involved with images. I mean, it is a problem, in fact, because it's really important to, in my opinion, to educate the public about how we make our images. In science, for example, we are not permitted to muck around with the data and, and, and enhance like crazy. Sometimes I do enhance, but I always, for example, indicate when I am you know, pushing the histogram a little bit. But in general, I, I, I definitely have been doing this for about 26 years now, and I'm seeing a real change that the, in, the, in the research community. They're more interested in how to communicate to the public, not only to them within the, the community, but also to the public, which I'm very excited about. I think that's our way of engaging the public. One way is through images. Right, and so you're also teaching workshops yeah. for, for materials research, well, teaching workshops for researchers to communicate their science. And now because of COVID, you're doing a workshop virtually. Yeah, it's, it's actually a, a surprise. Uh, they're really working. And uh, I, it's mostly all over the Institute. It's not just material science. I'm, I'm supported by chemical engineering and mechanical engineering. And the, the way we do this is we ask the group, and it's a small group, we can't really do more than 14, to send to me their draft visuals, their, their graphics, their uh, po posters, their figures. And as a group, we dissect them. And the, I think the reason why, there are two reasons why it's working. First is it's their work and they walk away with something new. It's, I'm, not, I'm not just lecturing to them. Um, but also, it's getting them to talk to each other. And we're, we're not um, critiquing the research, we're critiquing the way we are visualizing the research. So there's a keen interest, and we, we make sure it doesn't go on too long, about two hours tops, and that they're really working, and, and we're doing a number of them. So I'm delighted. You know, there still is nothing better than face-to-face, -face, but it's close. And so we are focused on this task 
And so we do, in fact, look at a particular image and, and you, they're interested. So I, I suggest your viewers might try to start that on their own at some point. Yeah, that sounds like an excellent idea. Um, especially, I think, what may be nice, they're not critiquing each other's research, you said, but the images. And so it's very um, congenial then. Right. That, that's exactly right. And the other thing, and this is really important, for at least for me, there are no rules to any of this. I mean, there is one rule I continue to push, and that is simplify, 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 because <laughs> they usually put too much and you don't want to leave and look at the thing. But, um, you know, people, <clears throat> excuse me, people will say to me, well, what is the best color choice? And I'm not going to answer that because it really depends upon the situation and what it is that you're representing. So there are no, we, we discuss the fact that there are a lot of opinions on, on this. And it makes it, frank, to be honest with you, it makes it more fun. Yeah, yeah. And it's important. <laughs> yeah, getting more opinions and, and discussion about it. So it's not just one person's opinion. Exactly, exactly. Let me ask you this, do they sometimes bring in a, an example of a slide they plan to use for a talk and a slide has blocks of many images on it and a lot of text on it? Boy, oh boy, you know exactly what I get. <laughs> it is absolutely fascinating. You know, even, they even know that it's wrong. <laughs> and they will say, well, I just want to tell you this is a draft and I know it's a draft, but yeah, you know, the key, the, the, the challenge is you know too much. You know exactly where to look on your slide. But you cannot assume that I or the rest of the audience is going to go right there. So we talk about animating the slide. For example, start with, this is, I'm seeing more and more of this, which is great. You start with a blank canvas, you put one thing on and then you, and you talk about that one thing and then you put it, the next thing on. So you're animating the, the presentation. Um, it still is very crowded. And, and I try to talk, certainly about figures, for example, I try to talk the kids into really, do you really need this in this figure? Can you put it in the supplemental, for example? then we'd have a conversation about that. So it's, it's, I'm just trying to get them to think a little more. And, and also very important from, in my opinion, is not to leave it for the last minute. In, in my opinion, that the visual presentation should be part of your thinking from the very beginning of this particular experiment. How am I going to show the data? And you'd be surprised, it's, it's a clarifying experience to figure out how what you want to show gets you to edit out what is not necessary, for example. So it's a whole exercise, not only in communicating to the other, but actually communicating with yourself. And I've been told that that is the case. The other thing, if I could, if I could try to sell you more on this, Again, I didn't do any experiment, any data collection, but I informally ask each group whenever we met, how many of you, after reading the title and the abstract in the journal, how many of you go right to the figures? And invariably, everybody goes right to the figures. And so my question to those in power, if the figure is important, why aren't we training our researchers how to create more communicative figures? That's my soapbox for the day. <laughs> but it's, it should not be tangential, in my opinion. It should be part of their education, and it's not. Right. Someday, someday maybe we'll make it part of their education. Right. So what I read in your perspective that also intrigued me, you talked about um, an undergraduate course, and it kind of flips the table. You talked about an undergraduate course called Picturing to Learn, where um, it flips the table, I think, in that it enlightens researchers even more about how communicative their own images are. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. 
it wasn't a course, it was a program. Um, we had five universities. We, it was an NSF program. We asked undergrads to draw as if they were teaching a high school student various phenomena that they were learning in lecture class. And I still, to this moment, am supporting a website. It's called picturingtolearn.org, where you have access to 3,000 drawings. And some of them are mind-blowing and wonderful. And many of them are wonderful to look at, but in fact, they were misinformational. And uh, we have summary reports. If, if anyone's interested, they could write to me, and I'm happy to share that. Uh, the, it was really quite interesting because, for the most part, most of the drawings had problems. That they, it was clear that the student did not understand deeply the concepts. And so the faculty, one, uh, one of my faculty, in, in, uh, Professor Sadaway, he actually changed the way he was teaching something because he saw that the kids didn't have a clue what, what was the important part of, of the drawing. They even le left it out. Um, and so you could see what they don't understand by having them draw. And I, you know, I can imagine extending this to beyond science, you, you know, in any class, if, if you ask someone to, and I can't draw at all, but just sort of try to represent what it is that you're trying to say, and you can see when, when there's, a, there's a misunderstanding in their drawing. So, it, it, you know, I, unfortunately, uh, my program officer uh, thought it was a great small program, Felice, and that's the end of that. <laughs> I sure would like to continue with it someday. But it, it works. I think some of your faculty might want to take a look at that. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. And you still have the website, so the website's available for people. Absolutely. And please, anybody who wants to get in touch with me, I'd like to encourage it. Okay, and so you're saying you're not an artist to draw, but you definitely are a photographer. And we've got some images in the perspective article. Uh huh. Right, that's right. Uh, actually, the, fir the first one, I included the first one, which is material that came from Alice Nasto, who's a, who was a Mechie, um mechanical engineering student. She fabricated this material that emulated sea otter, uh, feathery skin, because they were doing insulation studies. And um, Alice's picture, which I didn't show, represented it in the standard way most uh, scientists would take the picture. And I did something, I think, interesting, just uh, nothing brilliant, but just basically folded it in a certain way and lit it. The, but the other thing which your viewers, if, you, if they're able to see the, the uh, picture, uh, I couldn't get everything in focus. I was using a macro lens and I took, uh, even, even uh, closed down to F32, I couldn't get everything in focus. So I took a series of images at different focal planes and stitched it together. This is an old technique that really, really works quite well. So everything is really sharp. Uh, it's like a confocal microscope. That's how that works. And you, it just stitches it together. Um, and you could get everything in focus. If there's ever a problem about depth of field that I encourage people to consider. So that was one image. And the, I think another image that I uh, published in the article was taken on a flatbed scanner. It's material that was 3D printed. And in my book, which I'm going to plug, <laughs> uh, Picturing Science and Engineering, um, the, you will be shocked at how amazing you can get images on a flatbed scanner, a good scanner, that you can set the depth of uh, the dots per inch. That's an important piece. But it's not that crazy expensive. And if you have devices, if you're fabricating devices and 3D material, so I just put it on the scanner 
and I folded part of it because I wanted the viewer to see that it was flexible. I'm trying to tell a story through the image and scanned it. And it got the cover of a, of a journal. So it's, uh, it's quite amazing what you could do. I, I, certainly in material science, you can do some amazing things with the right kind of scanner. I, I encourage your viewers to take a look at that. Yeah, no, it's an act of discovery, Judy. It's, you know, as I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm discovering more about the material. Because I, it's not only just documenting it for me, I'm documenting it to communicate to you. So I want it to be a certain kind of image that you will look at. And so the aesthetics is not trivial for me, but I, uh, that's a dangerous area to get into aesthetics because we all have different ones, different types. But it's basically, I, I tend to photograph very simply because I want you to pay attention to just a few things and not to get bombarded. It's what I hope to bring to the students. Okay, I think that's very good. You know, it's, it's um, a good point. I think it's bringing out that it's not only aesthetic, but we're actually learning about the signs when we're looking at the images and looking at how to show the signs. Exactly. I mean, what is it that you want to show? You can't show everything. You have to create some sort of hierarchy of information. And whenever we have the workshops, I will say when we look at the particular figure, what is the first thing you want us to look at? And if the scientists can't figure that out, they have to go back to the drawing board and figure it out. You've got to figure that out. You've got to figure out what is your hierarchy of information. Uh, it's not easy, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it's still, um, still a puzzle, and I it, think intriguing. Well, it's, it's, it's highly intriguing, and it really is one of the main reasons why I've been doing this for so long. Um, I mean, I'm constantly learning the dirty little secret that I'm learning all about engineering and science without being in the lab, you know, because I sit down with the, the PI or, or the student, mostly the grad students, uh, and they explain to me what it is that is critical about this particular stuff. And by the way, invariably, when they start explaining to me, they take out a napkin and a paper uh, or paper and start drawing. They are showing me visually what it is that's critical in this particular experiment. And so then I, I then, because I'm a visual learner, I think we all are, but that's another conversation. Uh, and, and so not only do I help them explain, but I'm learning about the science. So I wish... I wish I could encourage younger people to do this. It's, it's a fantastic way to make a living, I have to tell you. I'm very lucky. Yeah, I think you're very lucky, and I think we're very lucky. I mean, like I said, I love looking at your, your books. I love oh, them. thanks, Judy. I never know if anyone's paying attention, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we learn a lot from the perspective piece, so thank you for writing that for MRS Bulletin. You bet. It was a real pleasure. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.